How's everyone doing today? This is Chopping It Up Hardcore with Hal Capone, discussion number 86. Today, my special guest is Mike DiLorenzo from a plethora of amazing bands. I don't usually write down anything. I usually do my homework beforehand, but I mean, I just have to read this list real quick. CR, the one of the finest power violence bands ever. Celebrity Murders, Crushing. Death Cycle, Enrage, Faithless, Kill Your Idols, No Resistance, SSSP, Sleeper Slash Serpico, War Babies, pff, Fake Piss, and a short stint at Millhouse. He's probably been in a, you know, a bunch of other bands that I don't know too. But I'm so pumped to get to talk to Mike, uh, one of the hardest working guys that I see, uh, just a beast on the guitar and bass. So uh, just waiting for him. He'll be here any second. Hope everybody's doing well. Hope everybody's doing good. Antonio, I see you. Ron, what's up? Crazy. I got a puppy. Last two weeks, it's been insane. Here we go. I'll grab you right now. Hi. What's going on? How are you? Can you hear me all right? Yeah, you're perfect. Perfect, perfect. Yeah, I'm doing a little uh, parking lot pimping again. Uh, it's a little crazy. Right on. A little, little crazy at my house with three dogs and, and my daughters and stuff. So uh, sometimes I do it here, but it's all good. It works, my man. <laughs> I want to thank you so much for taking time out to do this. I know you're working today and kind of I, I didn't I didn't really want to press you for time. So I just I, I appreciate it. I, I appreciate you uh, wanting to talk to me. I don't feel that I'm that interesting, but <laughs> let's see what we <laughs> Well, I mentioned all the bands that you were in. Um, I usually don't write down anything, and so I wrote down, like, a lot of the bands that you were in. Um, tell me if there's more, because right now I have CR, of course. Right. CR, of course. Energy. Yes. Go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> No, there's there's always more, so go on. And yeah, I'll, I'll uh, you, <laughs> yeah, definitely. Uh, CR, of course, Celebrity Murders, Death Cycle, Enrage, Faithless, Kill Your Idols, No Resistance, SSSP, Sleeper, you know, Slash Serpico, uh, War Babies, Fake Piss, and, and Millhouse. You had a short stint in Millhouse, too. Uh, is, there, is there more bands that you can name? There, there's a lot of bands. I mean, a lot of it was, you know, I did fill in stuff here and there and probably stuff from when I was a kid that really didn't do anything. But th those, that's the that's the main, that's the meat and potato, the vegan meat and potatoes of it. Nice, nice. Um, usually my first question when I when I do these talks is... Listen, I just saw Vinny pop up, Vinny from uh, oh, Fake Piss, and, and we have another project, brand new, brand, brand spec new called Medicinal, so... Add that to the list. Nice, nice. Yeah, we'll have to talk about that. My class laugh. Um, usually my first question is, what kind of music were you into as a kid before you learned about hardcore and punk? And then what kind of turned you on to hardcore and punk? Like, what was the transition? Um, well, I was I was pretty lucky to have a, a pretty musical household uh, in as much as my, my parents both love music. They they had record collections. Um, my mother, um, very similar to, to Jeff Altieri, his, his interview that he did with Drew Stone, she was into like soul and R&B and doo-wop stuff, you know, so a lot of Supremes, Frank Bell and the Four Seasons, Motown. Um, my father was, was was a rock and roller. You know, he, had, he was into, you know, he had Doors records and Hendrix records and, and Zeppelin records and but he had the, the one record that was the game changer of all game changers, which was the first Black Sabbath record. Yeah. And I saw that record and I picked that shit up and I was like, what the fuck is this? I was the well, I didn't say fuck because I was like seven. <laughs> but, you know, probably something, probably something, the adolescent equivalent of that. Like, oh, my God, this is very scary. So uh, I put it on and I was like, what the fuck? Again, I probably didn't say fuck. But uh, so that was kind of like the beginnings of it. And there was always music on, you know, uh, my mom and I used to listen to Rolling Stones a lot. Um, so from there, you know, I, I, I was, I was really obsessed with music early on. And when I was, when I was six, <clears throat> my grandmother, my father's mother bought me Kiss Love Gun of all records to buy a six year old <laughs> Kiss Love. Gun. That was like, that was it. 
that was like the fucking launching pad. You know, that was, uh, I, I was never so obsessed with anything in my life until I got that record. So, you know, Kiss was the big one. Kiss got me looking for more. And then I, I got into, you know, heavy metal. So I was into like Ozzy Osbourne yeah. and, and Motley Crue and, and, you know, Iron Maiden and Judas Priest and things like that. And, and from there, uh, the, the way my evolution went was Slayer, Venom, um, Metallica, things like that. And actually, I, I kind of, and I got into like the Dead Kennedys early on as well. Um, I just thought the name was funny, so so I got it. But I really got into hardcore and punk bands a lot through Slayer. Yeah. Um, you know, they were really into hardcore and punk. And I remember watching the Ultimate Revenge video. Uh, I guess I was like 14 when it came out. And, you know, Dave Lombardo was wearing a DRI shirt. Yeah. And they're talking about DRI, Black Flag, uh, verbal abuse, mm. things like that. And I saw Slayer in 85 or so at Lamore. And DRI opened, and that was just, that was it, because I had never seen anything like that in in person. You know, they were playing really fast, and but they weren't singing about, like, boobs or the devil. <laughs> yeah, you know, yeah. fuck. Then, then I probably did say, what the fuck? Uh, and, and I was just blown away, and I had, you know, I had really long hair and a beautiful mustache, and I was like, oh, well, you know, time to cut my hair and shave the mustache, I guess. But, uh, um, and then there, there was people, uh, you know, a, a group of people I went to, to high school with. Like I said, I mentioned Jeff Altieri before. He was one of my first friends in high school on Staten Island. And um, and and my, my hetero life mate, Michael Casey, who's in there somewhere right now. And, and his older sister, Dawn, and, and her boyfriend had gotten me into a lot of music. And we went to a lot of shows and stuff together. Um, Tom Calamara um, and Vanessa Cheatwood, who were also in our high school, were very instrumental in getting me into a lot of stuff, uh, hardcore and punk stuff. I think I went to my first CBs matinee with Tom Calamara, uh, 86-ish or so. Um, so I started getting into to stuff like that. And, and Jeff and I did a, a, a fanzine called, wait for it, Death Dealer, right? <laughs> and we interviewed a band from Brooklyn called, called uh, actually, Again, Michael Casey, Reverend Tattoo Geek, sent me one of the only existing copies of Death Gala that still exists. Uh, we interviewed a band from Brooklyn called Stillborn. Mm -hmm. And and again, this is about 86 or so. And Mike Catricola from Stillborn had made me a tape of what, like Victim in Pain and, and the Age of Carl demo and things like that. Yeah. So that re high tone had really gotten me into the New York hardcore stuff from there. So that that's kind of like the, the Cliff Notes version that, that, yeah. Yeah. That's that's how I got it. I have a, I have a very similar background too. I mean, me and you were almost the, the same. I, I listened to, you know, I was into disco when I was real young, like maybe five, six, seven. And then all of a sudden I started listening to heavy metal, going to concerts with my mom. Uh, she took me to like Judas Priest, Scorpions, Ozzy, Rat, Motley Crue. I mean, all that stuff. And then like you, I kind of got into like, you know, thrash metal, kind of darker bands like Venom. I was into Venom. I was, uh, like, <laughs> I have to say this because you're a big boy VOD fan. I was a big boy VOD fan uh, when I heard them, uh, Creator, stuff like that. And that kind of just bridged the gap for me to, into, like, the New York uh, youth through hardcore stuff, like Youth of Today, Judge, uh, Bold, stuff like that. And then up here, obviously, I'm from around Boston. Slapshot was big for me. And, uh in, in like Wrecking Crew and stuff like that. So, I mean, that's kind of how I got into hardcore and, and punk and metal. Yeah, a lot of people have a similar, I noticed the guys who are like a few years younger than me, uh, the Long Island guys uh, in particular, we had, we had different stories. A lot of the guys from the city and, and Staten Island, the boroughs and stuff, we all got into metal, I mean, hardcore and punk from metal. And the guys out here, what I noticed, except for like, you know, Derek from Neglect, maybe, got, and, and Ron Grimaldi, hashtag Ron Grimaldi, uh, got into it from, like, new wave shit. Like, they were listening to, like, Depeche Mode and the Smiths and Bauhaus, and they got into it. They got into hardcore and punk that way. Huh. You know, no not nearly as hard. 
Yeah. <laughs> now, were you a skateboarder? Because I always ask this, that people did a lot of skateboarding. Were you a skateboarder? I, I was, and to a certain extent, I, I still am in as much as sometimes I get on my skateboard and I push and I ride it. But uh, skateboarding is probably as important to me. Well, maybe not as important, but, but I, I still love everything about skateboarding. I still follow it. I, you know, I, I fell off some in the 90s when the wheels got smaller and the pants got bigger. But, um, you know, I come from, you know, the Bones Brigade and, and Dogtown and Z-Boys kind of guys. Yeah. And, um, but there, there's some new guys like Andy Anderson who I really love. And, and uh, you know, yeah, I still, I still love skateboarding. And, of course, you know, all the all this old skate rock tapes and Jody Foster's Army is one of my favorite bands of all time. Again, going back to Michael Casey, you know, that, that was like a big bonding thing for us. We went to see... JFA in Philadelphia, I want to say maybe 2018, Mike, maybe it was 2018 or so, and we both got um, skateboarding shark tattoos from the cover of Valley of the Yakes. Yeah, lo love skateboarding, love Jody Foster's Army, love hardcore, love punk. Nice, nice. Um, you were born... I don't know how... You, you were born in Brooklyn. Um, were you uh, a hip-hop yeah. Were you a hip hop head back, back when you were growing up? I, I don't love the rap. No? no I, I don't love... Um, hold on, Darren. Hold hold on on that real quick. Um, I you know I, I like I love old stuff, and to me, old stuff like like Run DMC and um, and Public Enemy. My my favorite of the rap is De La Soul. Yeah. Uh, if I'm gonna of all time, uh, of course, having done my 11 years on Staten Island, mostly through the 90s. There you go, Maddie. Sunken Temple Records, Wu Tang. Uh, of course. And the cool thing about that was, I don't know if any of the other Staten Island people are around, like in the 90s, <clears throat> the Wu-Tang guys would come to hardcore shows uh, on Staten Island. Um, like you wouldn't see like Method Man there or anything, but like Inspector Deck and you got and stuff. And they'd stand outside, uh, especially where Freedom Tripoli used to do shows uh, at this place called The Joint where that was really in the hood. Uh, and they'd give out flyers and they'd give out demo tapes and they'd give out stickers and it, you know, you would just see those guys around. When I lived with Bricks, we were right on the other side of the expressway from where Park Hill was. We would go over there sometimes, and there was a deli over there. You'd see, like, Raekwon in there buying whatever those things are, the cigars, to smoke cigars. And, you know, um, it was cool. So, But otherwise, no, nah, you know, uh, the rap, I, I don't love the rap. When I do like it, I, I get really into it. Like Grand Invincible, a project that Dan from Spaz does. Mm -hmm. That shit is fucking incredible. Uh, it really has to, and there's not a specific sound that that I listen for. Yeah. Um, it just it just really has to grab me, um, you know. Yeah, but I don't. I, I, as as far as genre, genres go, uh, the rap is pretty low on my list. Yeah. <laughs> Our, oh, and Dan, the token entry record, love, 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 love. Mm. That's a great album. Yeah. Um, what what got you into playing guitar? Uh, was it were you at a young age when you started playing guitar? I started playing guitar when I was eleven. I started playing when I was eleven. Um, my father was a drummer. My father was a pretty sick drummer um, when he was a kid, and um, but we I grew up in apartments in Brooklyn, so you know I was obsessed with music. I. I, I I loved seeing pictures of my father playing drums, uh, but I couldn't play the drums because we were in apartments and, you know, it, it just wasn't feasible. So my aunt out here on Long Island, actually, in Hicksville, where I live now, um, she always had this, this nylon string acoustic guitar. So when I would go over to her house as a young kid, I, I'd mess around with it all the time. And, you know, I didn't pick it up and start going or anything like that. It was just like, bah! you know, I loved it. And she gave it to me. And I went to take lessons, and and this is an important thing. I, I wish I, I wish I could remember his last name. I had a guitar teacher, from when I was 11 years old at a place called Maggio Music in Brooklyn. Uh, his name was Joe, and I'm left-handed, so I went in there with this fucking <laughs> nylon string guitar, completely upside down. Like, all right, coach, I'm ready. Uh, and he was like, and the room was like this big, and he was like, no, and he just flipped it the other way and he taught me how to play right-handed which is one of the best things anyone has ever done for me because as we all know and i'm sorry Artie shepherd even though i know you're probably not watching this um 
left-handed guitars are hard to find, they're expensive, and they're fucking weird looking. So, you know, it was just easier to learn to play guitar right-handed. Uh, so yeah, I started I started at 11, and, and uh, then from there I learned how to play bass. I still play drums a little bit as well, but um, not nearly as, as well as I played drums and bass. And here's, here's speaking of left-handed guitar players, Tone, Anthony Corallo from Kill Your Idols, Sick of Talk, Stiff Little Tone, and Cheer Terror. He's the, the, the drummer. Um, he plays right-handed guitar upside down completely, and he plays real proficient that way. And it's wow. the wildest fucking shit that you'll ever see. Wow. He just, like, he doesn't restring it like fucking Corallo Hendrix or anything. He plays it fucking upside down, and it's fucking wild, and he plays really well. And he's, his right hand, probably from masturbating so much, is like, <laughs> dum, 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 dum. you know, so... Sorry. Oh, that's amazing. <laughs> what the fuck was that? What was that? Okay, never mind. Sorry. Hi. Go on. <laughs> um, so that that being said, what was the first band that you started? I I mean there was probably a, a billion of them, but the first band that I was in <clears throat> that played live shows, like like Mike Casey mentioned before, was a band called Last Laugh. It was a uh, you know, a generic straight edge hardcore band we started um in uh third period lunch also fuck off like who gives kids lunch at third period it was like 10 13 in the morning but all of us had the same lunch period at susan wagner high school and um we started off and our original name was just another youth band and uh and we were just gonna play covers but then i i figured out like i could write songs like i wrote pretty okay songs and um yeah, we, we played a bunch of shows. Like we played, you know, a lot of local shows. And then we played some shows in like Brooklyn and stuff. We played with like Biohazard and Maximum Penalty and Burn and stuff in, the, you know, so that was from 87 to about 91. And also in there, uh, concurrent to that, I was also in Enrage mm. uh, during that for, for, for a while. Um, so those, those were the first bands that I was in that did stuff. And Enrage did a lot of stuff. Um, still together now. I mean, Jeff and Mike Pellegrino have kept that thing solid for, for Jesus Christ, it's going on 40 years now, I guess. Um, unless I can't count, which I can't. Anyway, um, but, you know, that band played a lot of great shows with, with a lot of national acts all over New York and, and stuff. So that was fun shit. Yeah, that, that's, that's amazing. Um, can you talk a little bit about the New York scene back then and all those bands that you were playing with and the scene back then? Because that was huge for me. Um, when I started listening to hardcore, um, you know, all those New York bands that you had just mentioned, uh, I mean, Breakdown, and I saw a lot of those, I, I saw a lot of those bands up, up here in Boston, um, Token Entry, stuff, stuff like that. How was that scene there? I only got to go to CBGB's once. I saw Crumb Suckers in uh, 80, it might have been 87, maybe, possibly. Um, but that... Yeah, I, Crumb Suckers at CB's. Um... But those shows were great. It was a lot of fun. And, and I'm still dear friends with a lot of the people that I went to shows with back then. You know, we would go to the, you know, you would work whatever. I don't know how we afforded this shit, but you'd work whatever menial job you had or delivered whatever newspapers you had as a kid. And you, we jumped. I, I would say if it was 10 of us, it was 100 of us that used to go from Staten Island. We would all meet up at the ferry because we all came from different parts of the island. We'd meet at the ferry, take the ferry in. We would take up a whole fucking train car and go to, we would go to the pyramid club or we would go to CB's, you know, they would have the pyramid club would have the matinees on the Saturdays. CB's would have the matinees on the Sundays. And, and the, the shows were fucking amazing. One, one of my favorite shows I was thinking about just yesterday, cause someone had posted a picture of the in your face record. And uh, I bought that record from Tim chunks at a pyramid club matinee that, Token Entry had played with Our Gang and Hogan's Heroes, and that was a fun fucking show. And, you know, we were all at the shutdown show, you know, Grill Biscuit Side by Side, Youth of Today, when when, when CB shut down matinees because everybody was on stage. And, um, you know, getting to see Warzone, you know, the, the many different incarnations of Warzone, and even seeing, like, Carnivore. And, and you know... No, and not to play down the importance in, in my life, of course, Lamore in Brooklyn 
was, was super important to me coming up in music too, because, you know, I got to see all the sick metal bands and all the sick brass bands and then all the crossover shows, all the crumb suckers and nuclear assault there many times. So um, it's all kind of one big mushed memory for me right now, to be honest. But, you know, I've seen, I got to see so many bands and I'm lucky I, I got to play, yes, Smoke Machine Warzone, November 7th, 1987. Why I always remember that, I have no fucking idea, Mike. Um, so this was a Warzone matinee at the Pyramid Club, and it was American Standard and Super Touch, and Warzone played. And while Warzone was trying to set up a smoke machine, and Mike and I walked up to the front and we're like, you know, hi, Ray. You know, we're like these fucking kids. And all of a sudden, the smoke machine came on and was like blew in our face. It was <laughs> fun and funny. And then after... After um, Warzone played, YDL got up and played some songs, and this was after Rob had left. It may, someone out there could probably correct me if I'm wrong, it may have been the first time they played with Nick, but I'm not sure. Um, and then, you know, Crackdown was another band I used to love to go see. And one of my, another one of my all-time favorite matinees, I, I don't remember the actual date, but Raw Deal, I want to say it was Absolution, Raw Deal, um, Vin, Jesus Christ, you're distracting me with all those things. Uh, Absolution, Raw Deal, Life's Blood, and Sick of It All. There had to be 18 gazillion people there. And, uh, and it was the first time I saw Raw Deal. It was one of their early shows. And I remember, like, as soon as their set was over, they, they had sold out of demos. I booked it to some records, which was on 6th, I believe. And, uh, and they still had copies of the demo. And I also bought the Life's Blood 7-inch that day. And to me, um, the Life's Blood 7-inch with the Straight Ahead 12-inch are the two best records to ever come out of New York hardcore. I will not debate this. Um, you're wrong if you don't think that. That's the collective view, not you, Hal. Everybody. <laughs> those records still get me so fucking pumped. Like as if like I'm seeing those bands for the first time. Oh, that was another one, the Peak Sake Benefit with the Straight Ahead reunion. There's a video of that fucking shit on YouTube. And, ah, man, I get goosebumps just thinking about it, which you can't see because I'm such a fucking hairy gorilla. Um, that, you know, when, when Tommy Carroll is like, everyone front to back, tear this place down. Oh my fucking God. It's like nipple hardness. Like thinking about that show, like those bands were like, they were, I used to call them the, well, later on in life, I called them the openers, but they were the best bands. Yeah. They were better than no disrespect to sick of it all or AF or, or Warzone or anything, but like life's blood and crackdown and straight ahead and bands like that. They were the bands that stole it every fucking time for me, hands down. And, um, they're the ones that made the biggest impressions, and they are still my favorites. That's that's amazing. I love all those bands. That those bands that those bands were special to me too. I mean, I loved everything from a, being a Boston kid, loving New York hardcore so much. I mean, I think a lot of Boston kids love New York hardcore too. But there was some <laughs> Boston kids that that stayed with just Boston hardcore, and they kind of like you know a few bands here and there. But I loved New York hardcore at that time. It was such a special time. Um, it's funny you mentioned Carnivore. They were they were at that CB show that I saw at Crumb Suckers. They played with. Oh, I, was there then. I think I have a flyer. Maybe Lethal Aggression played too. Fuck yeah, New York Hoods. I'm glad Mike Casey is here. This is why he's my hetero life mate because he keeps reminding me because I'm fucking senile. <laughs> um, but yeah, that was that was a sick show. Yeah, that was my only CB show that I made made. Uh, speaking um, speaking of Boston, did you ever come up to Boston to see some shows, or did you play Boston back then? When I was in a rage, we did some shows in New England with Biohazard, and those shows were a lot of fun. We played, I got to play the Rat. Mm. We played the Rat with Biohazard and the Bruisers. Um, and I remember we were, like, a little bit worried because we had, like, a couple of long-haired guys in the band. We're like, fuck, you know, like, even though, like, you know, I was, like, skinhead or skinhead adjacent, like, we were afraid that we didn't know these dudes, you know, and we knew yeah. Boston was kind of fucking rough and tumble. We were like, these guys are going to, like, want to fight us. And it wasn't the case at all. They were so fucking nice to us. Richie is still a friend of mine to this day. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah, I hadn't gone, I, you know, I didn't go to a lot of shows in Boston. Last time I went to a show in Boston, me and Tone drove up to see Battle Ruins and the Templars. <laughs> where was where was that show at? That was at the Middle East downstairs. Middle East downstairs. <clears throat> 
I've, I've played up there a bunch of times. Sheer Terror played there a bunch of times. Kill Your Idols played there. Um, but as far as traveling up there to go to shows, I didn't I didn't make the the hike that often. Yeah. Although SSD is is another one of my all time favorites. Yeah. And that I don't have... that that was my first show that I ever went to when I was a kid. And uh, uh-huh. I say this all the time. It was DYS. Um, SSD and the Angry Samoans, and I was 11 at the time, <laughs> and it was at the cha- yeah, it was at the Channel um, in Boston, and I was so scared because I kind of had longer hair too, and I saw everybody kind of had shorter hair, so I was like, uh, so I was scared, so I didn't go to shows until I was like 15 or 16 in Boston. After that, because I started, I still liked like thrash metal at that time too, so I saw a bunch of shows at the Channel. Like uh, I had seen Voivod on the uh, Dimension Hatros tour. Ah, oh, favorite Voivod record. They're my favorite band of all time. So that's like, oh fuck. That new album is fucking awesome. Yo, they, those led the last three full lengths are yo Chewy. I, I got to interview Chewy for No Echo, and not only is he a fucking gentleman and just a wonderful guy, like you know. Piggy is is my favorite guitar player too. Obviously, so fucking. Oh, thanks for fucking showing up, Allie. Um, anyway, uh, at Chewy just does such a great fucking job of of filling Piggy's shoes. Like he's just a master and such a sweet fucking guy. And his writing too is just it's right up there. Yeah, it's right up there with. It's, it's, it, dare I say. It's right up there with Nothing Faith. It's right up there with Dimension Atro. It's right up there with Killing Technology. And, uh, yeah, I, I'm, I was gutted that I had to miss them on this tour. What up, Dick? <laughs> <laughs> Fuck you. Um, Don't I'm... even get started with this one. Can you kick her out of this fucking room? <laughs> anyway. Um, I wanted to talk about CR and how that started. Um, one, of, one, of yeah. the, one of the greatest in, in like, probably – one of the bands that started Power Violence, or, or you know, close to it. Um, how did that come about? How did it start? Wow. Thank you. I, you know, well, we came quite a bit down the line from, from the bands that influenced us, which were, you know, we wore those influences on our sleeve, which was obviously Infest, Crossed Out. Um, <clears throat> Man is the Bastard was a big one for us, especially Grover, which is why on the LP we list him as Grover is the Bastard. <clears throat> uh, we so Brian Bricks now Bricks uh, and I were, were very dear friends for a long time uh, when I was in Sleeper and Serpico we used to play together with his band Fallacy which was a great fucking band from Staten Island um, he was actually going to move to California and we had never done a band together so we thought it might be fun <clears throat> to just do a band play some cover songs, maybe play a couple of shows, and then we would see him off to California. Um, we went to the studio, and we started jamming on covers, and then I was all... I had these really short, fast songs that I wanted to show them, and I showed them, and they're like, they fucking loved it. And um, we were actually a five-piece when we started. This guy, Vin Higgins, used to play second guitar. I don't know why he didn't wind up going past the first show. Um, but, yeah... Uh, and that's how it started. And, and, you know, we were super, super into that shit, that, that California power violence stuff, that just lightning fast, you know, super political, super personal shit. Um, and in New York, there weren't a lot of people doing it at the time. There was a lot of, you know, you know, gold tooth knockout kind of bands and punch, punch your neck, kick your face bands. And, you know, and then a lot of cry boy, crying boy bands. Uh, so we were like, no, we don't. This is what we want to do. We want to just come out and we want to fucking play super fast and we want to hurt you in the process. <laughs> and, and that's what happened. And um, I'm super proud of that. And um, you know, we were only together for a few short years. What's up, Tommy Cargan? Um, um, but yeah, to CR means a lot to me. Uh, a lot. But uh, And keep your eyes open for... Uh, Something to that's going to go down in the next year, and that's all I'll say. Oh, you nice. can also the other information. Nice. So, <laughs> so, so, what was first? Was it the the self titled seven inch that came out, or um... yeah, the self titled seven? We did. We had a, a rehearsal demo 
we had, we had a rehearsal demo. <laughs> Darren, that's actually uh, Ron Morelli, uh, who's now a world famous uh, EDM DJ, who was in the band Hanson and Devola. Uh, he actually coined Gold Tooth Knockout. <laughs> anyway, uh, we had a rehearsal demo we used to just give out for free at, at shows. And that is what eventually became the Lost Tapes, which we self-released on a CD and then later Sunken Temple Records released on cassette. Uh, but our first official release was was the self-titled 7-inch that came with the Flexi for free. And because the 7-inches were delayed, even back then, um, which was probably like a month, you know, compared to fucking now, we played a show at um, Rock and Roll Cafe, right, Tommy? Was that the name of the place? We played with Silent Majority, Kiss a Goodbye, um the Motaba Erwan Conspiracy, and I want to say maybe 1.6 band. So we gave out the flexies at that show because we really, really wanted people to start to have the music. So that was the first official stuff that we put out, yeah. And then after that, it was the John Lisa LP that, that was the next thing? Then we did, actually, the split with Millhouse, probably. No, no, the John Lisa LP, because then we recorded what we called the Puncture Session, Dave Patricios of Millhouse and Greensleep used to have a studio called, it's a bodega now, of course it is, um, of Millhouse and, and Greensleep used to have a studio called Puncture. And we recorded five songs there that came out on various releases. So um, it was, then the Millhouse split came out. And then there was a song on the My Scene Sucks compilation. Uh, and then the Save You comp and the All About Friends compilation that Carrie Whitney did. So that that that's pretty much everything that we we had recorded officially, um, and then we had a song on a comp called "Fuck Christianity." Um, speaking of fuck Christianity, fuck, fuck, fuck the Supreme Court. Yep. Burn that fuck ground. Burn that shit to the ground. This is fucking unacceptable in 2022 that we have to worry about reproductive rights in this fucking country. That women and people of color are being treated as second-class citizens in this fucking country. I mean, not not to take a fucking wide left on this, but fuck them all. And everyone should fucking go buy this fucking shirt. It says abortion is awesome. And it's a, it's a uh, benefit shirt. If you go to melissabeck.merchdirect.com, go buy it and buy yourself a bunch of fucking lighters and burn every fucking church and every fucking government building in this country. I agree. hundred percent. I agree. hundred percent. This world is fucked right now. So fucked. Yeah. I, I could barely fucking function at work today because of the shit. It was almost as bad as when I was at work and I found out fucking Trump won the fucking presidency. I fucking couldn't, I, I was in fucking pain all day and the same today. And you know, fucking shame on you. If you consider yourself, a hardcore person or a punk person or, or anyone of any kind of underground fucking subculture and you support that shit. Agreed. hundred percent, hundred percent. Yeah. It's wild. I was, I was, uh, I was at a loss for words today when I heard about it. You know what I mean? Especially, I mean, I have a wife and two daughters and, and shit like this is happening now. And I mean, what's, what's coming next? You know what I mean? Yeah. Fuck you have any, Oh my God. Hail Satan aboard everyone. <laughs> you know, it's I, I, I won't I won't veer off too far again, I'm sorry. But that once I mentioned the fuck Christianity comp, the the fucking kid with the crayon that works my brain started connecting dots, so right on, Mackenzie. <laughs> fuck. Oh, oh now I'm sweating now. I'm sweating. <laughs> sorry, I didn't, through... I, I didn't mean to get I didn't mean to get you worked up. <laughs> All good, man. It's what I do. Um <laughs> We'll, we'll go back to CR for a second. Um, the, fir the first song that I heard uh, was off the Nothing Quiet on the Eastern Front uh, compilation. Yeah. And um, I was like, holy shit, like what, is, like, what is this band? And then that's when I, I, you know, started to try and get as much as I could. And um, I saw CR once in Boston with, that. I, I put the flyer on, on my story. It was like with 454. Oh, you were at that it was uh, 454 Big Block and uh, Get High. And... You know, one of my favorite compliments about CR I ever got was from that show. 
um, Colin from Colin of Arabia had come up to me after a Killer Idol show. And he was like, holy fuck, you were in CR. Yeah, he's like, I was at that Boston show. And he's like, every time people would take a step back, you guys would take a fucking step forward. Yeah. He's like, you were so kind. We were just dickish that way. Like, we were like, you know, they, we when people would be talking, when, when Bricks was trying to talk, we would be dead quiet and just look at everyone until they shut the fuck up. And then we would continue. Like, that was a great show. We almost didn't make that show because we had a... Um, an accessoride bust, you know those things? Yeah, yeah. We had, that's what we used to get around in, and that's why everyone thought we were a gang for a while, because we always showed up with 30 fucking people. <clears throat> um, it broke down on the way, on the way to the show, so, um, but some kind soul at a, at a rest stop was like, oh, it's probably just a fuse, and he gave us a fuse, and then it started up again, and we made it to Cambridge, so. Nice, nice, yeah, that was a great show, definitely a great show. I was, I was, honestly, I was there to just see you guys and get high, but I mean. Right on. But, uh, yeah. And I'm, uh, I don't know if it was that show or, 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 I think I was wearing a Florida State University shirt on purpose. <laughs> I had to be the dick, you know. Yeah. Uh, uh, no, no. What the? Sorry, go on. Uh, speaking speaking of CR, you played with a bunch of great bands. I mean, uh, talk you. talk about the bands that you enjoyed playing with and seeing when you were playing in CR. I know, especially in New York, for me, I kind of, you know, put Devola and Murdoch in, in that category yeah. in, in Millhouse and stuff like that. Um, just talk about, like, the bands you played with then. Well, if I could fucking... If I could fucking you know, jerk Long Island off for a little bit. Um, we were, Long Island was like a second home to us, right? And the, the people there and the bands and the people that I became close with, which were some of the main reasons I even moved out to Long Island when I did in 96, um, they were everything to us. We, we became very close with them. We were very close with Millhouse. We were very close with Silent Majority. We were very close with... Motaba Erwan Conspiracy. We were very close with Half Man. Uh, we were very close with Black Army Jacket, Long Island adjacent. But, you know, um, those were the bands that, that and Devola from Long Island, like you said, these were the bands that we loved and we loved to spend time with and that, that, that meant the world to us. You know, we, we, the PWAC, um, two of the best shows I think I've ever played in general were PWAC shows. One was a show that we played with Silent Majority, Indecision, By the Grace of God, and Indifference from Staten Island, holy fuck, in the front room of the PWAC. And they had to be, the front room of the PWAC was packed front to back. I mean, it was, there, there's a video from that on YouTube and it still gives me chills. And then we headlined the back room once with uh, the Judas Iscariot and La Magna um, which had which had uh, Steve Jerskill of Half Man and Skate Grace, one of the best voices in hardcore. Um, very, very overlooked. One of the best fucking... That, that opening scream on the um, La Magna 7-inch, mm -hmm. the first time you hear Steve's vocals, it's just this long scream. Dude, that thing is fucking bone-chilling. Like, <clears throat> so those are bands... That, that meant a lot to us. I'm, I'm going to, you know, we played with a lot of bands. We played with, again, Indecision was another brother band to us. We always played shows with Indecision. Um, we would play, we would play up in New Paltz. Ron from, uh, Hardcore Ron from uh, uh, Devola would book us up at this place called The Teen Scene. Mm -hmm. um, and it was just, uh, dang, it, it, that, was, that was great stuff. We would play with Indecision there. You know, we played, they played our record release show. And again, uh, Murdoch, who CR shared members with, another brother band, Herjaza. Now, speaking yeah. of Murdoch, holy fuck. Yeah, good stuff. Great, great, great band. Um, yeah, it, it, those were the bands that, that, that meant the, the, the world to us back then. And we, we played with so many. I'm trying to, like, think of, like, flyers, you know. Like, we played some fucking weirdo shows, too, like. We played with um, Earth Crisis in New Jersey. We played, fuck, I should have had like a book of flyers readily available. 
but th those are the bands that we liked to play the most with for sure yeah and shout out to frank because he's kind of the one that got us together uh he yeah that's right frank mentioned it to me that's right yeah so yeah they, they played a, a benefit for Vinnie Roseboom's daughter Alina um, recently with 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 Gabo and Buck, dude. That band just blows me away. Her jaws are, but of course, fucking gospel. I can fucking commit acts of verbal sex to gospel all, all fucking night. Holy fuck. Yeah, go gospel gos gospel is amazing. I saw him up here. Uh in Atkinson, New Hampshire, actually, and it was so fucking hot. It was like 100 degrees in this community center, and a girl actually passed out on their amps and fell into the amps and, like, passed out, and, you know, the show stopped, and they pulled her outside, and luckily she was all right, but it was, I swear to God, it was like 100 degrees, and there's a picture of me filming it, and everybody has fucking pants on, and I'm the only smart one with shorts on in there. <laughs> I don't have pants on right now. Um, well, I mean, of course she passed out. Vinnie Roseboom is a beautiful man, for Christ's sake. Jesus Christ. That's true. That's true. There's no denying that. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, Vinnie's amazing. Vinnie's the man. He's he's awesome. Uh, it was so fun talking to him, too, uh, when I had to talk with him. That was great. Yeah, oh, that was a great one. Yeah, that was great. Yeah, Vinnie's great. Okay. Vinnie's great. Um, I wanted to talk about touring with CR. Did you guys go on major tours when you were in CR? We were, we were regional as fuck. We, we played, you know, New York area. We, the furthest we went is Cambridge, I think. Yeah, that's the furthest we went. Okay. Yeah, we, we do a lot and we, we were together a short period of time and, and we played a lot, but it was, um, we, we did not tour. I did most of my touring in that period of my life with Serpico. Yeah. You know, we would be on sometimes eight weeks at a clip. <clears throat> you know, the last one that we did, that I did, was Europe in 96. Eight weeks, and Elway from CR had come along with us as a roadie because, uh, as John Lee always said, the, the key to keeping me happy on tour was bringing one of my friends because I'm, I'm a petulant ch so... They needed someone to like keep me fucking in line. <laughs> so, uh, now, the, anybody part, hitting it right? <laughs> anybody that hasn't heard Serpico or, or Sleeper, um, what? How would you describe it? I mean, I kind of describe it as I hate genre describing, anyways. But it's kind of like a post-hardcore indie-ish type of like rock and roll style. Yeah, you know, it, there, there was a there was a a huge evolution of sleeper from, from the first seven inch through the last seven inch. Really. I was on three of the four LPs. Um, you know, the way I describe it most, it was, it was, it was heavily influenced by, by DC stuff. Obviously we were, you know, we were jerking dag nasty off all over ourselves. You know, proudly. Mm. You know, Dag Nasty, Soul Side, um, Monsula, like anything like that. Any anything that was that was melodic and and had some yeah, who's could do descendants, thanks Mike. You know, things like that. That's what that's what we did. You know, they were they were the older guys to me. They were all a few years older than me. So when I was asked to join the band, I was like blown away, you know, because I was always in heavier bands. So I was yeah. like but John Lisa and I had become good friends at that point. So um, it was cool to be in that band. I, I did a lot in that band, and I'm super proud of that stuff. Nice, nice. Um, I wanted to speak about Artie uh, Philly, Artie White. Um, did, did you fill in in Millhouse before Celebrity Murders? Obviously that happened because Millhouse ended and then Celebrity Murders started. Um, how did you get with Artie and... and um, how was it getting along with Artie back then? Uh, because you know, all you know how Artie was back back in the day. I mean, he's he wa he's still one of my dearest friends. You know, we uh, we met well, we met earlier than that, but we became friends when Sleeper and Mind Over Matter toured Europe in '94, mm -hmm. and he was with them. 
Um, and then when, when we got back from that tour, Millhouse had just started. They had the demo out where he sounds like a, a cat that's being fed into a fucking paint chipper or tree destroyer, fucking whatever you want to call it. Um, and, you know, I was close friends with Andrew Orlando. I, I was close friends with the band. Mm -hmm. And I was more than mildly obsessed with Laura, their bass player. That's really, that's another, that's a story for another day. Um, but Brian and I were very close. Andrew Orlando and I were very close. Dave and I were very close. And Artie and I were very close. Uh, and CR would play with them often. And even Serpico would play with them often as well. Yeah. Um, so right before, Artie and I had both moved away at the end of the 90s. I moved to St. Louis and he moved to Baltimore. Right before we did that, we both moved. We started Celebrity Murders. It was a completely different lineup, though. Well, Chris Russo was still in it, but um, we had a different drummer at the time. Uh, and then we were like, oh, I'm moving. So am I. Um, fuck off. Um, uh, hold on. Jesus Christ. I, Ali, fuck off. Get out of the room. Um, oh, so then we both moved back at the same time, too, in 2003. And we put it, we put, we decided to put Celebrity Murders back together. So we got Dan Crowell from Half Man and Chris Russo from Black Army Jacket and together, Dan Who Swims. Um, that's a great story. Fuck, if there's time I need to tell that story. Um, and we put it together and we wrote some gnarly fucking shit. And uh, that first demo is, I still fucking love it. And then after we recorded the demo, <clears throat> we asked Brian Meehan from Millhouse, obviously, and Kill Your Idols to be in the band, to fill it out, because I wanted to have two guitar players. Yeah. Uh, and then Dan was leaving the band to go play in Matt Pond, PA, and we got Elway from Murdoch and CR to play drums. And he just kind of came with Sean, John McCann, who is in her Jaza. And um, Frank, is he, was he in Murdoch? I don't even know if he was in Murdoch. And he's in Omega Glory with Brian Meehan now. Um, second show with Wet Nurse Mike. Um, and um, and that was the fucking lineup. Like, that was the fucking lineup. That, that's the lineup that wrote Time to Kill Space, which is probably my favorite record that I've ever written. Celebrity Murders is, there you go, hands down my, my favorite band I've ever been in. Not, no disrespect or, or anything to any of the other, other bands, but Celebrity Murders by far was, th there was just something about this fucking band that, Someone told us once, they're like, Jesus Christ, you guys are like a bunch of fucking jackals when you're together. Because we were, like, we fed off each other, and we we were just like, oh, I miss that band. I do. And when I left the band, Eddie Ortiz from Cattle Press took my place, and I couldn't think of a, a better person to do it. Much respect to Eddie and Cattle Press and Arbor. So, but that band was, that band was something else, man. It really was. Yeah, I, I mean, super underrated. I feel like Celebrity Murders doesn't get talked about enough. Um, I fucking love everything that you guys put out. I mean, it's really amazing. Like, so, so brutal and so just heavy. And it's like, I don't know, it gives you that feeling like when you listen to it. I, I listen to it all the time still. And talking to Artie a little while back, uh, such a great guy too. When I asked how you guys got along, I mean, you just see like oh. you, you see how videos are where he was you know not with the band but i mean i'm sure you guys got into like some shit but at shows he, he on stage fucking regularly like I, I was i was a little i was significantly bigger back you know towards towards the end of my you know the middle and, and end of slavery he would always make fat jokes at me and italian jokes but i fucking love I, I love him, and uh, I saw him just down at Maryland Death Fest, and we hadn't seen each other in quite a few years, and uh, it was like no time had passed at all. Me, him, and hashtag Ron Grimaldi went out to lunch one day, and that lunch could have lasted for fucking days. We just had a fucking blast. Uh, I love the guy. His new band is fucking sick, too. So Yeah, yeah, definitely, definitely. Artie's the, Artie's the man. Uh, I did a podcast uh, just about obscenity in the milk. That's how much I love Millhouse. Great. When I was asked to, to, to fill in for Millhouse, I, you know, I took, they told me what songs to learn. I learned them. I was like, all right. And then Brian Meehan is a fucking evil genius, man. He's like, well, close, but no. And I was like, fuck. So he had to like reteach me everything. And 
So that that shit was wild to play. That was a lot of fun to play. Yeah, great band to. Uh, that was a lot of fun too. Now, do you have any good memories of shows that Mill that you played with Millhouse? That any any uh you know uh, stories you can tell about Millhouse? I well, we we played a show on Staten Island shortly after CR broke up. Actually, um, it was like my triumphant return to Staten Island. I remember somebody being like, "Oh man, it's pretty brave of you to come here." I was like, "Fuck off! I'll knock you out." Um, but we played and. So there's a video, and I think I think Lou the Genius has a video of this fucking show. In the middle of our set, somebody, and I'm pretty sure it's Chris Baldwin, who was who was uh, in Glassjaw at the time, breaks into the room in the Lindenhurst Bulldog mascot outfit, and he's moshing around in the fucking Lindenhurst Bulldog outfit. And it was so fucking good. Oh my god! And then one time. We we played in Washington D.C. with with Glassjaw, and um, Artie for whatever reason Chris Russo was playing bass and Artie bit Chris so hard I think he drew blood I don't know why he bit him, but uh, and then yeah the, and there was lots of off color jokes that were made and yeah <laughs> it was a trip man it was a fucking trip so so who who's Wilder is is Artie or Paul Bearer Wild Wilder to deal with in a band like live you know what i mean i mean you know there's no denying paul bear's mastery yeah. right but Artie is, is in a category all all his own really like just hands down it, it I, Artie, Artie white and and tom cargan are probably the two best front men of all time i'll, I'll go there fuck you yeah, Artie, exactly. Artie, Artie, Artie's amazing. Like, he's literally a, a, amazing. I, I mean, Millhouse is just so fucking amazing to me. I love Millhouse um, so much. Like I said, I, I, was, I talked at maybe an hour and 15 minutes just about Obscenity in the Milk and how awesome it is, and, and uh, I love that album so much. And everything that, that Mil, the CR Millhouse split is, is uh, super rad to me. I love that, too. And, that right. Worst play out of all time, but love that fucking record. Yeah, definitely. Well, there was a show before I was in Millhouse that Millhouse played on Staten Island, and Jeff and Mark Altieri from Rage used to book at this place called The Rock Palace, right? Great fucking venue, but it was called The Rock Palace, mm -hmm. and it was on Staten Island. And Artie was just fucking brutal. At one point, he was like, he was like, my pants are pretty tight tonight, but are they tight enough? For the Rock Palace. Oh my God. So fun. I think he also destroyed the crucifix from his father's casket that night, if I'm not mistaken. Well, it was funny. It was funny because he, I saw a video where he was like talking shit about Race Trader. And it's, and I asked him, I was like, do you still, because <laughs> he's in a band with one of the guys from Race Trader now. And I was like, do you remember this? And he's like, I don't remember it, but he's like, it definitely probably happened. And, uh, uh, it's just it was just great to watch like clips of him just saying wild shit all the time. Yeah, there, there should be there should be a seven inch of if not a double LP of of Artie in between song banter for sure. I mean, there, there's Millhouse reunion when when we did the reunion with Silent Majority in 2005 or whatever. Just the fucking banter between those songs alone. Could be an LP. It's just he's he's absolutely he he's an evil genius. He's fucking brilliant. One of the one of the smartest people I've ever met as well. So, yeah. I mean, I'm pretty dumb, so that's not saying much. But he was pretty fucking smart. Yeah, he's super. SMR. He's super witty and, and definitely a genius at what he does. Uh, um, it, it, like shout out to Artie and like I said, thank you for doing a talk with me too. Artie was great talk to as well. That was a good. Yeah. Um. Back to celebrity murders. What what kind of touring did you guys do? And uh, do you have any wild stories about touring with celebrity murders? Well, it was it, again. That was pretty regional stuff. But we um, we got into fights with everybody. <laughs> like literally, it all, it didn't always get physical. But like we were celebrity murders was very confrontational. We were very fucking aggro. Um, we were very arty. And, you know, Artie would say shit and, you know, 
I wouldn't think twice about backing that up in a second. There was a show we did <laughs> in an anarchist bookstore in Brooklyn. <laughs> Holy shit, like real like lefty bookstore, you know, cool place, but Artie wore, oh my God, fuck me, a, a Mussolini shirt, right? <laughs> so like, it was so fucking wild because they were yelling at us. Like, fuck you, you fascists. And then we were like, and Artie's response to that was, what, it's my favorite pizzeria. <laughs> so that was like fucking, it may have been one of Brian Meehan's first shows with us too. And, but like, we were like ready to throw down and like all our friends in the back were like ready. We were going to like smush from both fucking ends. But they would get, but then like, these guys would like yell at us. Be like, fuck you, fascist, World War Two, And then we'd play and they'd mosh. And then we'd stop and they'd go like, fuck you, you're fascist. And then, you know, Artie would say something else fucked up. And I would, you know, start getting ready to swing my fucking guitar at someone. And then we'd play and they'd mosh. And then Will Tarrant was like, okay, you know, it's going to go down. Here we go, you know. But And, um, yeah, everywhere we went, we seemed to get into something with someone. There was there was a night bar in Baltimore. Oh, uh, yeah. <laughs> I was just the you know, way though. <laughs> yeah, you don't want to incriminate yourself, do you? No, oh, we definitely didn't try to rob anybody. <laughs> now, now was Kill Your Idols next after Celebrity Murders for you? Uh, when Kill you Your Idols was during and after. I was playing in, at one point in fucking time. I don't know how I stayed so fat during all this. I was playing in Death Cycle, Celebrity Murders, and Kill Your Idols at the same time, very often on the same shows. Wow. Um, yeah. So I when um, when when Paul um, from Black Anvil uh, started to do No More Black more full time because Kill Your Idols wasn't touring anymore, they asked me to fill in. Uh, while Paul was on tour with No More Black, and then eventually he was doing No More Black more, so the transition was kind of seamless. Uh, and I did that from from 2003 to 2006. Um, yeah. And then now again, I'm in Killer Idols, so. Oh, nice, nice. And always, you know, I was I was in, you know, Killer Idols world from day one. They were great friends of mine. Gary and I have been playing in each other's bands and replacing each other in bands since the 90s. When I left Serpico, Gary joined Serpico. Um, you know, uh, Gary got me in Sheer Terror. Then when I left Sheer Terror, Gary joined Sheer Terror. And we were in Kill Your Idols and Death Cycle together. And Gary played with SSSP, Rest in Peace Vinny. Um, so, you know, it's very, you know, like that. But Kill Your Idols has always meant, meant the world to me. And, uh, I love that we still do it. I love that Anthony Corallo is a part of it. Uh, I wish we would do more right now, but it's not in the cards. But we will. You know, we, we'll we'll get it going again. Yeah, Kill Your Idol, such a great band, definitely a great band. I wanted to ask you, where do you find the time to be in all these bands, and then, you know, obviously work and and um, you're married, correct? I mean, how how do you? Oh. Oh. <laughs> I, I'm in the I am I'm in the DIV process right now. I mean, where do you get all the time to be in all these bands? And, and, and on, on top of that, being avid uh, vinyl collector, too, I mean, like, your your record collection is, is ridiculous. I haven't had a full beep since 1994. That's, that's, uh, that's where I find the time. You know, it's, um, I, it's, the, it's the one thing I love more than everything. So I make the time. So when when people who I love and respect want to play music with me i um i want to do it you know there's so many people there's still so many people i want to i want to do project with you know um you know when i was asked by by matt messina to do fake piss mm -hmm. i was like over the fucking moon you know maddie has been my little brother for a long time now and I'd always wanted to, to do something with him, but you know, I didn't know the where's and how's and the logistics of it all. And when he said that fucking Shawnee and Vinny were fucking doing it, I was like, fuck yeah. And then Bass God is, uh, he's another one who I've known for 20 plus years. It was just the fucking, the perfect storm. You know, that that's the perfect example of people who I love like deeply as human beings, 
And that says a lot because I fucking hate human beings. Um, and respect so much and love so much as musicians. That that was perfect storm shit right there. So uh, that was a no brainer. I, you know, I have a hard time saying no to people. I recently had to turn down a couple of things because I really don't have the time, you know, but I, I try to have the time. You know, I try to make the time. Um, you know, even, you know, I see, I see Frank here and, and, you know, even I got to do one show in Murdoch and that meant the world to me because they were CR's brother band, right? Like I always want, I always want to stick my finger in all these fucking guys. Did that come out right? <laughs> Wait, what? Who said that? What the fuck was that? Did you hear that? I didn't hear anything. Man? No, it's, <laughs> there's something going on. There's something ethereal happening here. But it, yeah, that's how I find the time, and um, I uh, I sell blood to afford the record collection. So that, that's how I do that. I'm almost out, which is how I lost all the weight from when I was a giant fat so. so. Nice. That must, must be a lot of blood. Ugh, it's all the blood, Al. It's all the fucking blood. Um, I wanted to speak about sheer terror. How did that happen for you? And and what like. How awesome was that? I mean, obviously, you were probably a big Shea Terra fan back in the day. And then getting into Shea Terra, you know, uh, when you did. Dude, Rob Marinelli, when I, after I joined Shea Terra, Rob Marinelli resurfaced an old Enrage interview tape where we were interviewed on the radio. And, and, they were, and the interviewer was like, what do you want to be when you grow up? And apparently I said the guitar player of Shea Terra. So fast forward, fast forward, that, that's how the hip kids say fast forward, by the way. Fast forward to uh, 2010, and um, Sheer Terror, Paul Bear was, was offered a Japanese tour. Um, he, had, he had called Gary, who was the obvious first choice to do it. Uh, Gary couldn't do it. Gary suggested me. So Paul Bear called me. Um, I called my friend Jason Carter to play bass. Uh, I... Paul was like, do you know any drummers? I was like, I have the perfect drummer. And I called Anthony Corallo. And the rest is history. I mean, it was, we did a fucking lot while I was in it. You know, uh, I did a seven inch with them. I did a full length album with them. Uh, a lot of fucking touring. Uh, Anthony Corallo actually is the longest running member of Sheer Terra, aside from Paul, Paul Bear. Oh, no, He's been in the band. Uh, yeah. Um, that kid, I can't say, can I, can we talk about Anthony, uh, Anthony Corallo appreciation post? He, he's my bae, that guy, man. He's, oh, I'm going to cry. Love you, Tone. I know you're probably gone. Um, but yeah, it, it was great. It was great. And then, you know, when I felt my time was up, I, 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 I exited. Yeah. Now, now, now what was the, what was the first thing you, you did? Was it the spite, um, yeah. Release that was the spite that was the first thing. Yep. Yep. That the music sounds so good in the stuff that you did with Shia Terra. It just sounds so full, you know what I mean? Uh like that, that that's uh thanks to uh, Black Star Amplification who used to uh, endorse me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean the music just sounds amazing. Obviously Paul's voice yeah. is a little different, you know what I mean, obviously from but still Gary Bennett had, had a lot to do with, with that album as well. Gary Bennett, um, you know, my exit from the band was when we started writing the album. Then they were continuing to write the album. And then Gary was leaving and I stepped back in in 2013 and I finished writing the album. So Gary Bennett and Jason Carter also had a lot to do with, with the writing of that record. But yeah, I, um, you know, I take a lot of cues from Gary. Gary's my favorite living guitar player. I, I worship his tone. I worship his playing. So I aspired to kind of mix like a classic sheer terror sound with like my own sound and, 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 you know, WWGD, what would Gary do? You know, how would Gary make this sound? How would Gary play this? Had a lot to do with how that record came out. Thank you. Yeah. Standing up, standing up for falling down is, is sounds so good too. Like recording wise, it just sounds so good. Well, we worked with Dean, both of those records, Dean Baltimonis, and um, he's fucking awesome. I love working with him, so. Yeah, yeah, 
that's 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 awesome. I saw Shia Terra just uh, maybe I think it was like four or five years ago at the Middle East upstairs. Um, it was funny. There was a, there was a hip hop show downstairs that I was at, and I knew the promoter, and he worked for the Middle East, and he he's like, oh, Shia Terra's playing upstairs, and I was like, no way. And uh, he was he was like. Uh, I was like, can I go up there? And he's like, yeah, we'll go through the kitchen. So I went through the kitchen and I watched all of Shia Terra. And then I went back, I went back down to the hip hop show after Shia Terra had ended. And then Paul came down and watched like, uh, because the rapper that, uh, ended the show was slain and he must know. Oh, slain. Yeah. So yeah, they, they all watched. And I was standing right next to Paul, just watching on the side of the stage. Well, he's a good dude too. He, he used to come out to the Shia Terra shows when we were up there. Mm. Um, last year, Terry's show I did in Boston was upstairs at the Middle East, and it was a great fucking show. It was Us Forced Reality, MFP. It was a really, really great show. Yeah, yeah. It's uh, Middle East. I, I can't believe that place is still going going strong. I mean, that's the one that's, that's stand up, standed up in, in Boston and stayed going, you know what I mean? Everything else kind of folded up and around Boston. Great for- Jeff's kiss to the falafel. Yeah, yeah. hardcore stadium w- w- was like big too for a while, um, but but yeah, Middle East has been the main main. Thing. Yeah, that that place was really good too. Yeah, but um, yeah, I mean, how was like? Do you have any great stories about Paul? Um, obviously, like I was a big just can't hate hate enough uh, fan um, back in the day. I saw Shia Terra when I was young, like a young teenager. And, uh, of course, Paul got naked at the channel and took his clothes off uh, and poured some poured some jug of, I don't know what the hell he was drinking, but he poured jug all over his dick, or some juice or whatever. And <laughs> I mean, there, there's so many great stories. I mean, every story was a great story. Fuck. I, I don't know if I could actually, could actually pinpoint one, but I, I have a, we, we, we played in Belgium. First time our lineup played in Belgium in 2011 was at this place, Trix, in, in Antwerp, one of my absolute favorite cities in the world. I would, I would, well, maybe I will just fucking pick up and move there now. Um, and Super Touch played with us, right? And Paul was telling a story about how, you know, obviously it was satire, but it was so fucking funny. He said, you know, little do people know is that searching for the light is about the time Mark Ryan didn't pay his Con Ed bill. So, and then he, he, he did he did a, a, a fake Belgian accent. And they're like, what is this consolidated Edison? Is he fascist? And we're just all on stage like fucking losing it. Like, it was it was great. We we did a lot of fucking great, great, great shows with a lot of great moments. We we were playing in, in Miami once. I don't remember the name of the club. It was a real aggro show. There was like a fight, like right off the bat. And then um, there's a song off of um, Standing Up for Falling Down called uh, The Revenge of Mr. Jiggs. Mm. And Paul used to do a speech about a monkey and transgender. And it wasn't disrespectful at all. It actually made sense if people would fucking open their ears and listen. But someone threw a, an ashtray from the back of the fucking room and came up and started like screaming. It was fucking gnarly as hell. And, and then like some guy came up on stage and was like yelling at the other person. And I was like, yo, get the fuck off the stage. And he wouldn't. So I like, put him in a full Nelson and like brought him to the ground. And my guitar was still on. So I was like, ah, ah. so a lot of fun times, a lot of fun times. It's, uh, you know, it, it was great fun. So, so currently, uh, sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. All good. Uh, it, was, it was just an it was honor. Yeah, yeah. Such a great band. Such a great band. Um, currently, what bands are you in right now? I know, I know, Fake Piss, Fake Piss, War Babies, uh, um, Kill Your Idols. What, what else? What else are you in right now? Let's go through the list. So everyone knows Kill Your Idols. You know, we we just released the two songs off the split with Rule Them All, and hopefully we'll get a a couple of shows in this year. Um, War Babies, uh, which is me and my boy Darren, um, which is one of my favorite projects I've done in, in a really long fucking time. Um, so we did we did a demo, a split 12-inch with The Great Lie. 
uh, Motorhead cover, Lathe Picture Disc, and our uh, our LP just dropped. We have a 23 song LP on Hellminded Records. Go to hellmindedrecords.com backslash shop. I think that's what it is. I don't fucking know. Um, to get that, uh, the official release date is July 6th. That's when they start shipping. I love the way it fucking came out. Darren approached me in the beginning of the pandemic when I was in a really fucking terrible point in my life. Um, I was going through a lot of depression and, and, and some bad times. And he was like, hey, dude, how about um, you play over some of these drum tracks? And the next day, I, I think I sent him four or five completed songs with two guitars and bass tracks over it. He put vocals over it and we were like, yo, we have something here. Fast forward to now, we, all, we already have, we have 68 original songs recorded. We have two full recording sessions waiting for the album to come out and be out for a few months before we fucking release those. So there's War Babies and we just put a live band together with Anna from Outskirts and, uh, and our friend Corey from Total Meltdown uh, so we can be a live band. But War Babies will always just be Darren and I recorded because that's my boy. Um, Fake Piss, of course, who, who I went on about. We have our first cassette EP is coming out soon. It's called Night Phones. Don't let the fucking weirdo name fool you. This is fucking solid shit. I'm super proud of this. And we're already working on the second half, uh, uh, what we're calling phase two. We have another five songs in the pocket that we're ready to release. Out of Fake Piss came a project called Medicinal. That's me, Vinnie Roseboom. Uh, Matt Messina and our boy Steve, who runs the studio that we rehearse and record at. So look out for fucking that. Um, I'm also doing, well, I just got off tour a couple months ago with Black Anvil. Uh, I wish I could do that full time, but I cannot. But that was one of the best times of my life. Uh, what else do I do? Uh, Faithless with hashtag Ron Grimaldi and Anthony Corallo. We're actually looking to start playing live. So we're going to get a bass player in the mix because I play all the bass and the guitars on the recordings. Um, fuck, I must be missing something. I mean, I'm still, you know, Death Cycle will never really break up, but we haven't done anything in a few years. Um, but I'm still in Death Cycle. Um, I'm sure someone out there knows more than I even fucking know what bands I'm in at this point. Um, uh... Yeah, dead air. I'm not gonna keep you with dead air, but that that's that's the main stuff right now. So there's like five there's like five to seven like fucking you know working projects at any given time that, that I'm writing and, and recording for and we'll hope for all these fucking bands that I'm in, I haven't played live since December. So Yeah. Um Yeah, Mike Mike Kirschbaum, uh, Black Anvil unfortunately it was temporary. They they did ask if I would join, but I just can't, they, they have so much going on. They have a phenomenal new record coming out on season of Miss soon. And, um, and um, I just can't do the touring that they would need me to do. Oh, right. The Tom Jones tribute band called stuffed pants. Um, there's that. It's just, it's just me and Vinnie Roseboom and there's no actual music. We just wear really tight pants. So you can see <laughs> what the wangs are. And it's just, you just hear, it's not unusual to be loved by in the background. So, um, you know, it takes all kinds. It takes all kinds. I'm, I'm a melting pot of genres. Now, now is Fake Piss going to play some shows? Do you guys have any shows that you guys got lined up? No, no, be a minute, because we have this, like, pseudo rule where um, our songs, except for the exception of one or two, can't be longer than a minute 30. So, you know, and I, I I kind of went all dictator when they wanted to play a show. I was like, we can't play a show until we have 20 minutes of music. And like, geez, fuck you. Okay. <laughs> so, sorry, guys. And there's, there's well, we're a ska band. There's seven of us. So um, it's hard to coordinate between seven people, uh, especially when our boy Antonio, who I, who I saw pop up, what's up, brother, um, is in uh, Indiana. Mm. He's in Indiana, so when he does come, we try to get shit done. Um, you know, we, we, we finished up some of the vocals for the EP and did some scratch vocals for the next shit um, when he came in last time, so we try to stay as, produ oh, excuse me, as productive as possible. Um, 
you know, but uh, it's, I'm super into it. You know, it, it's when people ask, you know, we don't sound like, but we are influenced by Nation of Ulysses. We're influenced by Angel Hair. We're influenced by Drive Like Jehu. Mm. Uh, we're influenced by anything that fucking John Reese plops into a toilet, you know. So, you know, it's uh, it's it's seven guys who are seasoned musicians, who are all really good players, um, making some really fucking cool music. I I can't wait. You know, we did that. We did a lathe that has a rehearsal song, which is actually an old Prom King song, which has actually another one of my bands from the '90s called Prom King. Um, I really want people to hear this. I, I want people to be like, holy fuck, like, wow, this is cool shit. Like, because people, the people I have played it for, it wasn't what they expected it to be. And they really had no expectation, but it wasn't what they expected. And um, I like that. And it's all been positive feedback. And, um, you know, we're like, a, we're like a fucking tight knit family of, of, you know, of of obnoxious brothers that bicker and love each other and make music and you know we're kind of like the Osmonds, to be honest you know or the Bee Gees you know just but the Bee Gees again me and Vinny with the tight pants and the little dicks and you know <laughs> not that Vinny no, anyway no, no. what the <laughs> now is there anything that you haven't tapped into musically that you want to do like maybe in a different genre that you haven't done yet? 110%. And it's because I, I only know how to play a certain way. I want to be in Oasis more than anything. <laughs> like not necessarily with the Gallaghers, but I would love to play that kind of music. And I guess, you know, later Serpico wasn't that far off from it, right? Um, and even some of the style of a project with um, with Billy Hamill from Staten Island and Lou Dimmick from Staten Island called um, another one, South Shore Royals. Uh, we're supposed to be playing our first show in August. We haven't rehearsed yet. Uh, Darren's actually going to be a part of that if we can ever rehearse. But you're getting arrested? What the hell just happened over there? Um, <laughs> it's kind of, you know, it, I, I would love to play something like that or even like, like something like, you know, Jesus and Mary Chain or... Joy Division or, or Bauhaus or, you know, like that's that again, that's other like, you know, musical passions of mine. That's stuff that I love. I won't even say the fucking Smiths because no one can touch Johnny Marr. Right. But, uh, you know, um, like something like that. I um, Drew from from Brain Slug uh, had asked me once when I was playing in Brain Slug for a little while, if I wanted to do a, a, like a Brit pop thing with him, I was like, yeah, but no I was like I can't I just can't write that way yeah I, I know how to do you know I, I'm a one trick pony that knows how to fucking it all comes down to it's just recycled fucking Voivod riffs all of it you know and I have you all fooled <laughs> <laughs> now have you ever been in uh, have you ever played in a black metal band or, or like a yeah. I did Black Anvil, and that was fucking amazing. And you know, what was cool about that is they asked me in November to do this tour in March. So I busted my ass to fucking learn that shit because I am, and I'm not saying this to be self-deprecating, I'm proud of the fact I am a sloppy fucking guitar player. I am sloppy, 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 sloppy. And But that is part, and I think it makes my playing identifiable. Like, I think people who at least know bands that I've been in can be like, oh yeah, that's definitely Mike playing guitar. Um, so I had to like really kind of relearn how to play guitar. Like I bought, I bought a guitar just for this fucking tour yeah. because even tuning to C sharp, I'm usually in, in E standard mm -hmm. would maybe drop D aside from death cycle. That was in D standard, like playing in C sharp, even the way that feels using thicker strings and a wider neck or whatever. With, uh, and, I, you know, I can't be fucking, be, you know, I used to make jokes that I was like the ODB of guitar playing, you know, like I can't be fucking shit in my pants while I'm, you know, playing in Black Anvil, especially against fucking Jeremy Sauceville, who's one of the sickest fucking guitar players. Like I remember getting on a Zoom with Jeremy to go over some stuff 
And I was like madly nervous. He was like, what's up? I'm like, I'm like super intimidated by you. He's like, really? He's like, but you're so fucking good. I'm like, stop. I'm intimidated by you because he is like, you hear him, he's like, blah, 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 blah. you know, <laughs> you, you, you. you know, that's how he plays, you know, and it's fucking, it's intimidating. Um, but they had enough faith in me and, and gave me the opportunity to do it. And I think it came off really fucking well because those five shows were fucking solid. And that last show of that tour was at Irving Plaza. Right. Is that an Irving Plaza? There was like 1200 people at this show, hometown shit. Mm. Ah, oh, goosebumps, man. Goosebumps. Maddie was there. Maddie was fucking taking pictures and fucking throwing, pointing a laser thing at my fucking genitals the whole time. It was like... <laughs> and... No, uh... What? I don't even know why I said that. No, it's starting to get weird. Anyway, hi. Now, um, do you, get your, do you find yourself finding new bands um, to, to listen to, like, in the heavy vein of stuff? Fuck yeah, I love new bands. I've never stopped craving new music, right? Like, and even if they're not, like, like new or new to me. So, for instance, Paul from Black Anvil got me into this band called Concrete Winds. That is just fucking great brutality. It's, it's actual musical violence. Like, it's just one of the best things I've heard. And, uh, and, and fucking hardcore bands. I'm always listening to newer hardcore bands. There's a label called Not For The Week that puts out some gnarly fucking shit. So they have a, a band called Reckoning Force, which is funny because Not For The Week is a Life's Blood song. Reckoning Force is a Life's Blood song. They're on the label. But fucking fantastic. That band Spy. I love that band Spy. I love Gel. I love Gel. Dry Socket from PDX, my fucking people in on the in the Pacific Northwest who I fucking love. That's a great band. Um all the shit that the dudes from the fight do. Like the first of all, I love the fight. I love them as people and I love the band, but everything they do, like lethal and um fuck. I, I have all the, the, the tapes that, that they put out. All great fucking stuff. Um Stigmata. Uh no that stigmatism. Stigmatism. Um, with that that spoiler from uh, from uh, that did the cover of the Great Lie split on ours the Great Lie, fucking John Lafada and Scott Martin's band the Great Lie, Omega Glory Brian Mean's band Brian Mean's band Dead Torches Dead Last fuck yeah Dead Last is fucking amazing, um, fuck I, I uh, Honey I didn't like Honey at first and then I saw them live and I revisited the record and I fucking love Honey. Um, I just, I love to fucking absorb, absorb new music. Yeah, I love that fucking Zulu tape too, my good, good fucking call. But, uh, I love, I love to, I, I crave new music. Like a lot of guys my age, they're just kind of like, oh, you know, I like Agnostic Front. <laughs> yeah. Yep. Oh, I like Metallica, right? No, like I, I love new music, you know, and, you know, I mentioned them before, fucking Herjaza. It's so fucking sick. And, you know, the other bands on Sunken Temple, like fucking um, Bass Guy. So there's Choke City. And then there's Maddie's other band, Kaiju. I, I'm not going to be able to pronounce it right. Uh, and Christ Head. Like all of these bands are from all different genres. And they're, they're great fucking bands. Great, great bands. And I get I get super stoked. Like if you look at my fucking IG, 29 Scrolls Things First, um, like you see, I post a lot of records. Mm. And a lot of it is new stuff. And when I get amped on new shit, like I try to fucking push it down your throat like a fucking zucchini. <laughs> nice, nice. Um, I don't want to. I don't want to keep you for too long. Yeah, yeah. wenches. Fuck yeah. That's a good band. Um, I don't want to keep you for too long. So usually I do uh, rapid fire uh, at the end of the talk. Oh. Uh, you ready for some rapid fire? Oh boy. All right, my friend. Hold first... on. <laughs> Hold on. Yeah, let's get ready. I got some fixed vapor rub. Hold on. All right. Let's fucking go. All right. Oh my God. Dying. First question. All time favorite New England punk hardcore band for you. All time in New England. Like Boston, Providence, you know. SSD or Drop Dead. SSD or Drop Dead. Good call right there. Um, and, and you played a bunch with Drop Dead. Celebrity Murders played a shit ton of 
shit ton of shows with Drop it Dead. Did, Star did, Celebrity Murders did, and Sheer Terror did. Yeah, Drop Dead is amazing. Uh, Built. Playing St. Vitus soon. Buy your tickets. Nice, nice. Uh, number two, what was your first punk hardcore show you attended? Like, real punk hardcore show, not like a battle of the bands. What was the first one that was, like, meaningful? I mean, it wasn't a punk hardcore show, but I'm going to use what I referenced before, seeing DRI open up for Slayer. You know, that that was, you know. And then my first CB's matinee was Murphy's Law. And I want to say Crackdown. So that was a huge one. Wow, that's awesome. Um, all right, my next question. What was your all-time favorite show that you played live? Obviously, you've been in a billion bands. Uh, give me a couple that really meant the world to you when the ones that you played live well i mean there, there were two that were were the most meaningful to me this is this is this is where mike d cries in front of all nine people who are watching this right now um my sister kim was was, was sick for a while she was she was diagnosed with a with hodgkin's lymphoma and a very rare kind of um tumor and this was in 2016, and I put two benefit shows together. And um, one was at St. Vitus, and it was Sheer Terror, Black Anvil, Indecision, and Enrage. And then the other one, which was probably the most meaningful of all of them because it was home base for us, was on Staten Island, and it was CR, Malcolm's Lost, um, Todd, I'm sorry, I, the, the name of Todd's band, which is escaping me right now, and and rage, of course, and and these shows were just so special because, you know, the, no one asked questions or batted an eyelash when I said I need your help. Mm. Um, Artie Shepard even offered me New Year's Eve. I was like, I'm not taking New Year's Eve from you, man. That's a you know, but it just shows how I'm not even just talking hardcore punk. Like, let's call it you know, underground music for like, a, we're such a community and, mm -hmm. and we really show up for each other when the time comes. And that CR set, I don't know if I'll ever play a more intense live show in my fucking life. And then that last Kill Your Idol show was dope as hell too. We played a, we played a VFW out here on Long Island and it was fucking, it was like the olden times, you know, yeah. a few hundred kids killing each other and then everybody got COVID. So literally <laughs> and, and each other but those two come to mind first and you know i love everyone who who had a part in those shows for sure yeah it's definitely a, a great community uh, you know like what's happening with Vinny's daughter um everybody coming together to do uh you know benefits for Vinny's daughter um you know i i tried to post as much as i could uh like i yeah. you know i was talking to my family and just telling the story and they don't even like hardcore and they were, you know, you know, hitting up and giving money and stuff like that. So, I mean, it's, it's the community is so a lot of people Alina talk a lot of shit. Is my, Alina Roseboom is my fucking hero. I love that entire family with my whole being, but Alina is my fucking hero. I don't know a stronger human person then Alina, you know, I got to see her about a month or so ago. And, you know, it just, it just makes me smile thinking about that whole day. It was such a beautiful day and a, a beautiful event that we were at, you know. And uh, and she was just having a blast. And she, she's such a beautiful person. There's a link to the GoFundMe in my fucking link thing in my bio on, on the Instagrams. Please visit. Let's never let this fucking... Go fund me, go away. Just keep fucking feeding that shit because, you know, we need to stick together. So definitely, definitely. Um, <laughs> all right, I'll keep going. Uh, my next question: What was your all-time favorite hardcore punk show that you saw, that you attended, that you didn't play at, that you went and went to and and saw? Ooh, all time, huh? That's. That's thirty-five years of thinking you're trying to make me do in a short period of time. <laughs> well, you can give me a you can give me a couple. I mean, so the Pete's Sake benefit was one of them. Again, that sick of it all show that Raw Deal played with uh, with with Life's Blood as well. Um, fuck, I mean, any of 
any any sheer terror show at CB's. Um, the the shutdown show, you know, uh, with Youth of Today, any Youth of Today show. Youth of Today is one of my all time favorite bands. Um, Warzone at the Pyramid. Like I'm I'm rehashing shit that I spoke about already, but these these were all such like shows that stick out. And then there was the show that never happened that I got fucking pneumonia. Um, it was 87, Youth of Today and Bold. I, they may have even still been called Crippled Youth or they were just trans. They were just making the change over to Bold from Crippled Youth. We were supposed to play the Pyramid Club and it was like like 20 below zero. And because, you know, I was smart, I just had on like a t-shirt with like a sweatshirt. And me and Mike Casey and Tom Calmar and this dude Bill and all our friends from Staten Island were there. And, you know, the, the the gates were down on the pyramid. No one knew what was going on. So we went to some records at the Pyramid Club, bought a bunch of records. And then at some records, there was the flyer and it said canceled across. <laughs> so we ran back to the pizzeria across from the pyramid and told everybody, hey, the show's canceled. And then uh, I got pneumonia. Yeah. So not a, a memorable one. Uh, it. A band that just you reminded me a while ago because you were talking about playing with Biohazard and playing shows with Biohazard. Uh, did you ever play a show with that, that band Mucky Pup? Not only have I played shows with Mucky Pup, I was asked to play guitar for Mucky Pup once. No kidding. Chris is a great dude, but I had just joined Sleeper. I, I, was, I was asked to try out to play bass for Super Touch, and I was asked to play guitar in Mucky Pup, and I had just joined Sleeper. It was all, and on that first Sleeper tour, we wound up playing in Germany with Super Touch, so it was all this, like, Worlds Collide shit. Yeah. Yep. Hippies hate water. <laughs> Three Dead Gophers. Three Dead Gophers, all named Harvey. Uh, so good. I, I saw them. I think I saw them. They were fun. Yeah, they were, they were good. I used to have the hoodie with the now on the back. Um and uh, and uh, you stink, but I love you. That that's what got them famous. It was the Bill the Cat theme song. They won a contest. They wrote a theme song for a comic strip character, and that's how they got big. Oh no, kidding! Fun as fuck band. Yeah, yeah. Fun as fuck. Chris, Chris does like three D printing shit. Mucky Chris, three D Mucky Chris. You can look him up. And uh, I have like a well, you probably can't see it, but like a Peter Steele bust that he did. Like he does cool shit. Yeah. So, shout out to Mucky Pop. Yeah, Mucky Pop. Um, yep, that's um, a good one, man. Land Landscapers was one of my favorite songs. They were they were such a fun band. They played Staten Island a lot, a lot. So when I was in Enrage, we played with them all the time. Yeah, yeah. Nice, nice. Um, I'll keep going. Uh, I'm a huge movie guy. Oh, nice. Don't you know? If you gotta cut me the fuck off, cut me the fuck off. I will. You you broke that seal. Now I'm just gonna throw up and diarrhea all over. So. Uh, I'm I'm a big movie guy. I watch movies all the time. I always ask this question: What was the last movie you watched? Oh shit. I don't know the answer to that question. And I know it was like three days ago, too. Like, I can tell you what I wore at that show where I got pneumonia, but I can't tell you what movie I watched three fucking days ago. That, it, this is a man in his 50s, man. I'm with you. I'm with you. I don't have an answer. I, I did finish Obi-Wan Kenobi last night. I wasn't, I don't, I didn't hate it. I didn't love it. Um, I did like that he said, hello there. Or whatever the fuck he says when he meets Luke the whole time. Yeah. Fuck you, Frank. I know I no longer like her Jaza, by the way. <laughs> uh, uh, fuck. And I've been watching this show, Wellington Paranormal. My friend Bria and I have the same exact fucking sense of humor and the same taste in TV shows. P.S. Letter Kenny, best show ever. But it, she, she hipped me to this show, Wellington Paranormal. It's on HBO Max if you haven't seen it relentlessly funny it's a show from new zealand so good right darren fuck that shit yeah it's, it's that that wellington thing it, it's like in the vein of what we do in the shadows but like as as like cops oh. it cops i've seen it dumbledore's dingler whatever it was called that last dumbledore movie dangling dumbledore oh, oh god crimes of brindle wall is that what it's called no, there's a new one called like dumbledore's Delicious dangler or something. I don't know. 
That I watched that. That was like that was the movie. That was a movie, and it took me. It's like a three-hour movie, so it took me like a week and a half to finish. Yeah. But thank you, Chantel. My my last movie was uh, Crimes of the Future, the new Cronenberg movie. Oh, I want to see that too. I want to see that. I want to see Doctor Strange. And what's this movie? Everyone's jerking off about now. Like half of the people love it, and half the people hate it. Mad God is that what it's called? I I watched uh, three quarters of it. Uh, it it the. The stop animation is great, but it's it, there's no cohesive story, so it's kind of like you're just watching it for a visual effect. You're not really watching it for a story. It, it, it's just it, there's no cohesiveness at all okay. with the story. Okay. Matt, write that down. Song title. Go. Yeah, so that was it. Delicious Dangler. <laughs> I Why does anyone talk? I haven't finished uh, Obi Wan yet. I still have the finale to go, but uh, I thought it was okay too. Oh, I thought it was okay. Totally Fuck. <laughs> yeah, but yeah, I, I liked it. Okay, I didn't hate it. Yeah, I wasn't a big fan of the Boba Fett series at all. Either I didn't finish it. It was horrible. I didn't finish it. He was a pussy. He got his ass kicked every every the, the whole time. I, th that's who break talking about in safe in a crowd when they when they say pussy they're talking about boba fett <laughs> coward pussy dick i won't say the other one but um oh my god yeah are you a letter kenny guy by any chance uh no no oh give your balls a tug you gotta watch it yeah i i i this i i have a list that i need to watch i'm so far behind and everything uh Vinny says the boys. I'm all about the boys too. That show's amazing. I watched it early on, and then it became one of those shows where I would just it would just be background for me. Yeah, so, I didn't dislike, it, but I, it lost me. It lost me in there. So yeah. Um, uh, my next question: all time favorite horror movie for you? Halloween. I'm a, I'm an actual Halloween two guy. That's my right on. That's right. my favorite. It's. It, I have like I have like a like a holy uh, or unholy trilogy. It's like Halloween, The Exorcist, and The Omen. Mm. It, any any different day uh, on a different day, it could be a different movie. But right off the bat, I, I'll, I'll say Halloween. Like you know, I, let me see if I like if you see up there, I have all my like horror ephemera like that. So yeah, seventy eight, my man, seventy eight for sure. Fuck man, no, yeah, have, that's that's. Have you seen the new movie X yet? I have not, and I'm super interested. I, uh, I I know these dudes in California that do this podcast that if you haven't heard it, it's called Forever Midnight. It's a horror podcast, but these dudes are three best friends, and they have the best fucking time. Like, the first 40 minutes is literally them laughing, but it's so good. And uh, they their review of it, like, really made me want to see it. I hear it's, like, the, like, may as well be called the next che Texas Chainsaw Massacre, but yeah. uh, I'm very very curious. Yeah, it was good. It was good. That and that, uh, I, that made me cringe a little bit, but you know, I mean, I guess you know, old people sex. I'm an old people now. Eventually, I might have it again, so I guess I shouldn't be too grossed out at it. <laughs> <laughs> that and uh, I want to say the sadness out of uh, I think it's South Korea. That movie was bananas. That, that was damaging. That was fucked the fuck up. Fucked up. Yeah, that was crazy. That was, yeah, that was wild as shit, man. Ugh. Yeah, I felt uncomfortable for the first time in a long, long time, and and that's what I want to feel. <laughs> I want to feel uncomfortable, and that movie made me feel a little uncomfortable. That was that was definitely you know, if something makes you more uncomfortable than Dumbledore's delicious dangler, then you know it's got to be, <laughs> you know. Uh, yeah, and that you know, so obviously you're a train train to Busan fan, mm. right? Yeah. And then uh, did you see the animated thing that they did? I didn't love the animated thing so much. It no. was like almost like a pre. Yeah, no, it was I... a prequel. I didn't love that, but yeah, but yeah. How, so to, to go back, Halloween for sure. Yeah, nice, nice. Um, my next question, I kind of add asked you earlier. Um, I always ask if you've been listening to any like rap or hip hop lately. Have you been listening to any lately in the past like month or two? Maybe Public Enemy uh, or Run DMC. I have not. 
But I, I mean, does it count that I just watched the, the Wu Tang television show that on Hulu to rap? But I, I got to clue you in. There's this female rapper coming out called Hardy B that's going to fucking take the world by storm. She's got this fucking diss track coming out that you wouldn't fucking believe. Um, I, I may or may not be producing this thing, and it's. Oh. Hardy B. Nice, nice. Listen. Nice. I'll, I'll look out for that. Definitely. Definitely. And uh, my final question, favorite song to play live. Um, give me, give me a few, give me a uh, celebrity murders, CR, uh, kill your idols and, and sheer terror. Give favorite songs to play okay. live. CR melting hopeful or um, long shortcut celebrity murders, total fucking overload or um what's the fucking war on the telephone kill your idols falling can't take it away autumn who's the other band uh sheer terror it, oh jesus fucking crap um oh man it was fucking it was definitely here to stay which we would open with and yeah. just can't hate enough to close with and then of the newer stuff Heartburn and G, which Gary Bennett wrote most of. That, that was a fucking, you know, there, there was, we played a show in Rhode Island. I don't remember the name of the venue. It was a Halloween show, and we were all dressed as the Penguins. Um, what did they call them? Not, they're not droogs, like cronies or whatever. Like, we all had black sweatshirts that said, like, worm or fucking dickhead <laughs> on and black mask and ball hats. So we played this Halloween show, and upstairs was a sex club. And there was like a like a sex orgy going on upstairs, and we were playing downstairs. And so we were playing Heartburn and G. And for all of you who are familiar with Heartburn and G, this is like Corallo's fucking double bass like moment. And this is and I told him I told I told him this day this is how you know you're a fucking double bass master. The when when he, when he kicks in with the double bass, the one metal dude in the whole club rushed to the front and was like, holy shit. Like, it was fucking amazing. <laughs> yeah, so, uh, so yeah, those, 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 uh, those were easy ones to, to nail down. I, I have, I have, I am biased towards those songs, for sure. Nice. Uh, at that show, say, at, at, that show so, at that show, it's too bad you didn't have your Ron Jeremy, uh, Harry Reams mustache for the sex club upstairs. You would have, you would have blended right dude. in. There was one like fucking see-through ceiling tile and it was right above me. So I would like keep looking up and like they would look like look down and I was seeing all sorts of genitalia <laughs> flapping over the place. And and the, the woman at the door and the door to the sex club was in our green room and the woman had a tail and Anthony was like, huh, that tail sticking there. I was like, Really? <laughs> That's how it's sticking there. <laughs> Very nice one. That's uh, amazing. That's amazing. Uh, Mike, I want to thank you so much for taking time out. This is amazing. It's been a long time coming. I know we're I know we're talking for a while and we're trying to work it out, but I'm glad that it happened. And uh, I appreciate you taking time out to talk to me. I, you know, I'm just a hardcore fan. I played in a bunch of small bands, but. Uh, I, it, it's an honor to talk to you, and, and thank you so much. No, seriously, thank you so much. You know, the fact that anyone wants to talk to me about anything is uh, is flattering as fuck. So, fuck you. Fuck you, not you. It's not my birthday, asshole. <laughs> so, um, fuck you. Uh, but, no, it's super flattering uh, to be asked to do this. Um, I really appreciate especially someone who's been around for so long, you know, um, just thank you for giving me the opportunity to fucking talk shit. So much appreciated. Yeah, it's been awesome. Let's let's stay in touch. I mean, I'm gonna send you a bunch oh. of shit anyway. It's like me and you always go back and forth anyway. So uh, let's uh, let's keep doing that and and stay in touch. And maybe you know, if I keep doing these, or I, I I'm talking about maybe doing a podcast, maybe a year or two, uh, I'll have you back on then too. So fucking a. And again, thank you so much, and uh, enjoy the rest of this beautiful weather, and have a great weekend. You too, my friend, and uh, have a great night. You too. I'll talk to you soon. Bye. See you later.